Christian Parenting. Welcome to the Living Wholehearted Podcast. We are Jeff and Tara Matson, a husband and wife team who is shrinking the integrity gap in our own lives and helping others do the same. I'm a leadership and organizational development coach, and Tara is a licensed marriage and family therapist. We believe that if you have a following, you are a leader, and how you lead matters. Whether you are leading in the home, work, or community, we are bringing you biblical, clinical, and relational wisdom to help you in every relationship that matters most to you. None of us do this perfectly, but we are leaning into the reality of our humanity and profound wisdom of grace. So if you live, have lived a little life and have journeyed a bit with God, you might have come to realize that God has his own ways that appear to run counter to our ways sometimes. We get frustrated with uh, his own um, agendas, and yet he's a good, good God. So we want to talk about how those two come together. When hard times hit and our prayers are getting answered, but in ways that we've never anticipated. God goes off script, as our guest today would say. So today we're going to talk about the idea of having a relationship with a God who not only allows suffering, but journeys with us in that suffering. We don't like it, but learning to embrace all of who God is allows us to live more free and with a whole heart. Albert Tate is the founding and lead pastor of Fellowship Church in Los Angeles County, California. He began his ministry pastoring just a few families at Sweet Home Church in Mississippi before serving the historic Lake Avenue Church in Pasadena, California. As a dynamic communicator, Albert is passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, both locally and globally. He serves on the board of trustees at Azusa Pacific University, the Global Leadership Network, and global church planting organization Stadia. Albert is also the founder and CEO of The Greatest Story, Inc., and president of Harm Ministries. His first book was entitled How We Love Matters, A Call to Practice Relentless Racial Reconciliation. And his most recent book that we're going to be talking about today is entitled Disobedient God, Trusting a God Who Goes Off Script. Albert is also the proud father of our four children. Uh, of our four children. <laughs> Not our four children. Oh, His sorry about that. Man, that was funny. All right. y'all, can, y'all can have them. Y'all can help with them. That's great. I love it. I'm glad, I'm glad we got some help. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we're, we're with you. It takes we're a here. village. <laughs> so. I'll try that one more time, that part. Uh, Albert is the proud father of four children, Zoe, Bethany, Isaac, and Micah. Hey, Albert, it's really great to have you on the <laughs> podcast today. It is so great to be here. So honored to be a part of the work that you guys are doing and the kingdom impact you're making. So glad to be here. So glad to be here. Well, you have a really impressive resume, and there are so many places that God is using you for his greater purposes. But we all know, the three of us and many leaders who are listening, that there's a story behind this journey of leadership, and things don't come easy. And it's often the reason why we're doing what we're called to do. Would you be willing to share a little bit of some of your personal journey, some struggles, and maybe things that are shaping the way you lead today and who you are and the call on your life? Oh, well, that's, I mean, that's easy. I am in the most painful, hard season of life and ministry, uh, mm. post-pandemic, um, during the pandemic. So I've got a 17-year-old um, uh, Zoe, 15-year-old Bethany, 11-year-old Isaac, and then I've got five-year-old Micah. So if you do the math, that Micah came in unexpected. Um, yeah. uh, we almost named him Tequila because that's where we think he came from. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know how conservative y'all are, so I don't want to get in trouble yeah, with your listeners. We appreciate that. But, I got friends but, in low places. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why when in the intro you, you, you said that it, we, it was our kids, we'll take all the help we can get because we got a lot of kids. <laughs> Man, we found kids. out that our youngest boy um, was autistic uh, on the spectrum, uh, during COVID. 
Um, so that dynamic, our marriage, LaRosa and I have been married for over 20 years, um, but just looked up one day and there was a chasm between us um, because we had become roommates that still loved each other, um, but were just taking care of kids, crisis management, um, and then looked up at a church trying to navigate a post-pandemic dynamic in Southern California, um, where we've been a multi-ethnic church, but, you know, 2022, even 2023, no one's celebrating diversity. Everyone's celebrating your own tribe, your own voice, and getting in your corners. So ministry is harder than it's ever been. Marriage is harder than it's ever been. Parenting is harder than it's ever been. So leadership is harder than it's ever been. Um, so a part of a part of my journey in leadership has been saying, okay, God, um, Nancy Beach talks about the seasons of the soul and recognizing that, yo, this is winter. Um, and I'm in a winter season. And how do you invite God in your leadership, in your parenting, in your marriage, in your church, when you're in a winter season? So that's where, those are, the, those are some of the lessons that I'm learning and just navigating just in real time, just really hard spaces where you just say, you know what? God is my refuge. And I actually really got to mean it this time because I don't have any other refuges. You know, we say that, but we really have other refuges. We really have other friends, other things we go to or whatever, you know what I mean? But there are moments and seasons in life. I don't think this is all life, but there are these moments and seasons where you're like, yeah, no, nah, God is all I got. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. God is like, yeah, this is where I've been longing for you to be for a long time. Because it is in that place where you realize God is all you got and he really is all you need. I remember when I first heard somebody share that with me. I was a young college student attending a uh, kind of a, uh, a city church near a university. Dr. Earl Palmer was the pastor of this church. And I remember he said something that just caught my attention that you just reinforced right there. He said, uh, he, speaking about God, and this guy was a brilliant theologian, and he was referencing Carl Barth and all this stuff, and I'm just taking it in like mm. a student. But when he said this, it's just like, okay, now that's what I needed to hear. He said, "You can put your weight down on that, on him." Mm. You know, and he mm. and he gave that visual and imp- that that for me was just hit me like a ton of bricks right between the eyes. It's like I'm gonna put my weight down on this, like yeah. you, all of it. It's like the yeah. trust fall scenario, and, and you just remind yeah. me of that out. It's one of those things to where. If, Because if you get good at ministry, and a lot of us, we get good at it, and that means you can really manage a high level of weight. Like, if we're honest, we can just carry some stuff. And we like, Capacity. I'm trusting God, but I got this. You know what I mean? I got it. Yeah. But yeah. I, Je- Jeff, to your point, I think there is a point where you get to, to where it's like, I can't carry this another step. And I've literally got to put all this weight on God. And if I don't, I'm not going to make it. And I think one of the one of the negative, it's kind of like almost a um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. If a if a bone breaks and if it starts growing back incorrectly, they break it again in order for it to grow back appropriately. Um, and I feel like I'm in a breaking season where God is saying, I don't want you to grow back wrong. So even if I got to break you again to make sure you grow back right, because to grow back right is to grow back knowing all the weight belongs on God. You are not his God junior where you carry as much as you can. And then the overflow goes to him. No, it all belongs to God. So if you are learning and growing as a leader, thinking that you need to carry as much as you can and then give God the overhead or give God the over, no, 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 no. Let me break you again so that you can grow back the right way and to know God gets all the weight 
cast your mm-hmm. cares upon him and allow him to be your guide and your God because he is good. Yeah. Yeah. So good, Albert. And I'm thinking about that moment when you're breaking again, you know, and how do you, and I'm asking you specifically, and then also maybe speaking to those listening and how you would pastor and shepherd someone here, but how do you not grow bitter in the breaking or the anger towards God? You know, yeah, knowing yeah, because yeah. There, there's that process of going, what are you doing? This is painful knowing that eventually you'll grow back healthy, but in the breaking, it's so hard. Yeah, because here, here's the thing. Either you're going to get better or you're going to get bitter, but you can't do both at the same time. So if that bitterness is there, that bitterness becomes a root and it taints everything you say. You know what the Lord told me? Uh, I'm in a season where I'm experiencing, even with relationships, dynamics that feel like deep betrayal feel like deep betrayal. Um, But God said, the only enemy you get to have is Satan. And I said, God, there are more people on that list. And he said, nope, uh uh-uh. The only enemy you get to have is Satan. That's been so hard Mm -hmm. to acknowledge that my enemy It's not the people that have disappointed me. It's not the people that it feels like deep betrayal. God says, I'm too good to you. And I've been too faithful to you. And I've given you too much grace and too much forgiveness for you to come through this with enemies. No, whoever they are, whatever they are, they deserve the same grace that I'm giving you. So I think the practice of not being bitter is to come back to that reality is that the only enemy I have is Satan. The enemy is not the people that disappointed me. The enemy are not the people that even mistreated me. The enemy is not, they can't be the enemy. I, um, I've, I've got to have a bigger vision of God's love and God's grace and to say, God's been too good to me for me to come out of this with a bunch of enemies and who are people going through their own thing, struggling through their own dynamic and all that. Because the bitterness is usually tied to people um, and, and or tied to God. And God is saying, you can wrestle with me, but the best way to wrestle with me is with me. So come on and wrestle with me. And in wrestling with me, I'll show you my love and my kindness and my grace. And over time, you will see that I am faithful that I am sovereign, but I am good. Check my resume. Check my credit <laughs> score. I've I've been faithful to you. Um, so trusting that. But the but 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 the big piece, Tara, is just surrendering. I just want to be mad at people. I really do. I want to be mad at them. I want to blame them. I want to make them the antagonist in my story. Um, but God says, nope, nope, nope. The only antagonist you get is Satan. That's the only enemy you get to claim in your life. Those people aren't your enemies. As a matter of fact, I probably use them more than you would even like to admit to bring you to a place of freedom and wholeness and to make you see things about yourself. So bitterness is just bad and you can only get bitter or you could get better, but you can't do both at the same time. So that's how mm. I would, that's how I would respond that's to good that. Word. And I'm hearing yeah. you say, I mean, in all of it, Albert, you're talking to God, you're bringing it to him. You're putting your weight back yeah. on him and he's saying, you wrestle with me. Don't take that out on them. Don't even like shove it aside and ignore it. Talk it out, process it. And God's talking back to you to say, I got this. I'm using it. Um, yeah. so that's what, I mean, in all of this, you're having dialogue with him, you're bringing it back to him. And, uh, sometimes we don't want to talk to him or mad at him or maybe that's me. I'll just speak with myself, but I even tell no, him, no, no, no. I'm, like, I'm think, not talking to you right now. <laughs> yeah, no. And I think, I think the thing about God is he can take it. He's not freaking he out. He's not intimidated by your questions. He's not, he's not like, Oh Lord, Jeff is mad at me. What we going <laughs> to do up here? Oh Lord. No. He's like, I'm good. I'm like, like struggle with me. But here's the key. Struggle with me. Yes. 
Amen. Don't don't okay. leave me to struggle with me. Doubt me, but doubt me with me. Like, let me come in and give me the opportunity to represent myself in your process. Most of the times when we doubt God or struggle with God, we feel like we got to leave him to struggle well. And God is like, nah, I'm good. I'm not intimidated by your questions. I'm not scared of your doubt. I'm not, uh, my feelings aren't hurt because you're questioning my goodness. No, bring all of that. Bring all of that to me and let's sit with it together and he will prove himself to be faithful, kind, and good, and real. Like, and re- you don't have to create some false and like some, some fake dichotomy or let me fake it till I make it or let me just not bring the... God is like, no, 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 bring it. I know everything you're thinking anyway, so you can't hide it. So sit with me in it and you will find me to be faithful even if you don't agree with me. God does not require our agreement. I got, I just lost one of my best friends. She died. She was 45 years old. I don't think that was a good idea for her to die. She has three kids. She has a husband. I, I don't agree with that, God. I don't agree with that. And God is like, cool. You don't agree with it, but I'm sovereign. I'm God and I'm good. But I get that you don't agree with that. Let's walk through that together. You know what I mean? So I don't think it was a good idea. I I think his time, I I think God's timing was terrible. And I can say that as a follower of Jesus Christ. I know some people just cringed when I said that. But there are things when I think, God, God, your timing from my perspective was terrible. But let me keep walking with you. And I trust you. And the old saints, you know, I'm from Mississippi. The old saints at our church used to say, you'll understand it better by and by. And that was their way of saying, there's a lot of things that will happen today that won't make sense to you at all. And that's okay. But over time, God's got a track record and a faithfulness to where you will understand it better by and by. Yeah, old hymns right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you, I like to say it this way, you know, uh, to your point, Albert, that about God being good and holding all this, which he, which he does. It's so relational. Everything you're talking about there is is mm-hmm. with me. God says, bring. God has our Father has broad shoulders. Mm-hmm. He has broad shoulders. Mm-hmm. We can't be pushing over on Him and moving Him. Although we move Him in our hearts, we know that, and uh, you see in Scripture even that. Where, uh, where we can come to him. And he even changes his mind sometimes in scripture. He did with Moses. He's done he it does. with several, which is amazing to he think does. that the relationship I mean, can't be used. He's not going to be manipulated. But man, the relationship being that close, wow, that's incredible. Incredible. We just want to take a moment to tell you about Living Wholehearted. We are um, a wonderful team of professional counselors and executive coaches who come alongside leaders, helping you live with integrity in every area of your life. Yeah, so uh, our newest member, uh, executive coach, leadership uh, consultant, Joe. Joe has got over four decades of senior leadership experience. He's a CEO of CEOs in companies like Verizon, American Airlines, Accenture, and others. Joe is, uh, there's not been a a fire or a a situation that he hasn't (laughs) experienced in his decades of of senior leadership. And so we love having Joe. Joe brings a a quality that I can't bring. I've got a few gray hairs here, but uh, he he has a seasoned leadership experience and decades of it. So that's Joe. Connie has been a writer. She uh, works with women in all sacred and secular spaces. She's got four kids. She knows what it's like to be running a career as well as running a home. And she also has launched churches. She understands ministry and work life. She's an incredible uh, executive coach. Rhonda has 30 plus years working as a pastor herself, and she is spending her retirement working on helping uh, pastors and ministry leaders not only develop leaders in their own systems, but to help with sabbaticals and learn rhythms of rest. So you can find more about our coaches, Rhonda at Living All Hearted, Connie at Living All Hearted, Joe at Living All Hearted, and obviously Jeff and Tara at Living All Hearted. You can go to livingwholehearted.com to read their full bios. 
But know that if you are a leader and you're looking for something that's more holistic, not a coach who's going to tell you to do more, but to help you learn and grow from the inside out, both from spiritual formation, trauma-informed mental health, and really um, evidence-based leadership principles that we know work on the ground floor. We are the organization for you. We're talking about disobedient God, and we're talking about some of this as a good segue here. Your book offers a refreshing perspective on trusting God through pain and trauma. You recently lost a good friend. So did we. And we both mm-hmm. feel in that those same questions. Why? Oh, Bad wow. idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and we can justify it on so many different points. But So yeah. we're trying to press in right now with you in that very yeah. same thing and timing right now, trying to understand. <clears throat> so some might be struck by those words, disobedient God, from a theological yeah. perspective. We're going to let you unpack this a little bit, <laughs> yeah. which is good. I love yeah. this. Let's start by yeah. talking about the significance and the clarity of how the notion of a disobedient God came to be. Yeah, well, I just think we talk all we talk all the time about we needed God at two o'clock on Thursday and he showed up just in time. Praise the Lord. I needed a check to come in the mail and the check came and I got the bill paid. Praise the Lord. What about the times when you needed God at two o'clock and it was a week later and you've heard nothing? Mm. What about the time when you needed a check to come in the mail to pay the bill and now the lights are literally off? Like, what about the times when God completely goes off script? What do you do with a God who refuses to surrender his will for your will? What do you do with a God who refuses to follow your to-do list? I mean, your prayer list. Um, what, what do you do with a, with, a, with a disobedient God? A God who goes off script and does his own thing. And, and I point that out to talk about more so our reaction and an invitation for us to be honest of how we respond to him. If you are the children of Israel in Exodus 32, what you do with the God who goes off script, they literally say, Moses is up in his mountain with God and he's taking too long. And they literally look at Aaron and say, make us another God. Give, 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 we, need, we need another one. So I, I want to push us to think about what do you do when God takes too long? Come on. We've had those seasons when he took too long. And what did you do? I think we're probably more like the children of Israel than we're willing to admit. And we literally say to God, God, you're taking too long. Aaron, make us another God. So they took their gold. He says, he says grab your gold. And it's interesting. So they're reaching for gold, but they're longing for God. So it begs this fundamental question, what are you reaching for and what are you longing for? And do you know the difference between the two? So um, we're longing for intimacy, but we reach for pornography. We are longing for security, but we reach for more money. Um, we're, (laughs) we're longing for comfort, but we reach for pills and alcohol. So I, I want us to sit in the reality of saying, yeah, God doesn't always do what we want him to do. Let's say that out loud and let's learn how to doubt well. Let's learn how to question God well. Let's learn from Thomas. Thomas knew how to doubt God right. I I love it. Thomas gets a bad rap, but he did everything right. Number one, he had doubts, um, and and they call him Doubting Thomas. First of all, how you going to name, how you going to put somebody's sin in front of their name? Like, we don't be like lying Lisa or, you know, uh, (laughs) cheating, cheating, cheating uh, chance. You know what I mean? (laughs) Uh, 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 Adultery Alice. You know what I mean? So first of all, how you going to put the sin in front of the boy's name? But Thomas, the, the text says, when you look at the Gospels and you read the story, they were all in this building. They were all in the house and, and they, make, they make detail. They make it a point to acknowledge that the door was locked. So they was like, they were in the room and the door was locked. The door was locked because they was all scared. They, was all, they all had doubts. 
Thomas was the only one that had the courage to say it out so loud. Unfair. You, you, so unfair. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's what I love about it. So it's an invitation to doubt like Thomas and say, doubt out loud. Say it out. Confess. Acknowledge. Hey, I'm struggling with this. I got issues with it. Thomas doubted right. Number two, he doubted in community. He didn't say to the disciples, I don't believe, so I'm about to leave. He said, no, I believe and I'm here. I, I, I don't believe, but I'm here. I, I'm struggling, but I don't believe. As a matter of fact, he doubted looking for Jesus. I love this. Thomas literally said, Jesus is going to have to show me the nails in his hand, the nail print in his hands and the nail print in his side. Not even one. He going to need a double verification. Thomas needs a double <laughs> verification of, of what it is. But I think it's beautiful because in his doubt, he was actually looking for Jesus. Some of us in our doubts, we ain't looking for Jesus. We're just looking for a way out. Thomas doubted in all the right ways. He says, God, I got doubts and I'm looking for Jesus. I, in my spiritual imagination, y'all, I just think about the angels coming and restoring Jesus's body and, you know, putting it back together again and, and them getting to the hole in his hand and him saying, no, 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 leave that, leave that. And they're like, Jesus, why are we going to leave a hole in your hand? And Jesus is like, Thomas. I know Thomas is going to need to, Thomas going to need to see, y'all know how Thomas is. Thomas is going to need this. In other words, Jesus is saying, Thomas, come with your doubts because I've made a way for your doubts and I've provided a grace. I left a hole in my hand to meet you right where you are. So I think there are moments when God's disobedient, y'all, when he goes off script, when he doesn't do what we want. And he invites us to say, doubt me, struggle with me, but the key is do it all with me. Like, I got a grace for you. I got a grace for your doubts. I left a hole in my hand because I know how you wired. I know how you think. I get it, girl. Here, see the hole. Thomas, come here. Put your finger right, put your finger right here in the hole. Come on. And here, hit my side. Put your finger in my side. And come on, because I know you, and I know what you struggle with, and I know your doubts, and you get to do all of that with me. So the book is about God's disobedience, but it's so much more about our response to him in those moments. And it begs us to really wrestle with, when God goes off script, what are the familiar things from Egypt that we reach for and that we go to? What are the cheap counterfeits that we reach for? When I'm disappointed in God, I, I tend to replace him with pornography or food or, or anger or trying to get more money because I think that's the thing. James says we all... we. We all got a lust. We all got something that we go to. We all got something that's from Egypt that's familiar that we'll go to and grab. The reason why they built the golden calf is because that's what was familiar to them. So we go back to what's familiar instead of trusting the one who's been faithful. So what I want to ask and invite us to sit with is, ah, what are you longing for? But what are you reaching for? And are you going back to what's familiar? At the, at, the, at, the, at the expense of the one who's been faithful. It's so good. So good. And I rarely am brought to tears as I'm listening to our guest, mm. Albert. And I'm just feeling um, grateful for your message for such a time as this. I mean, I'm thinking about all of my clients over the years and, and particularly those I sit with now. And you know, most leaders will just speak for the high capacity you spoke earlier who who can carry a lot. Um, they can carry a lot because in their earlier years of their story, they were the one the go-to in their families of origin or the survival of their yeah. trauma. And you just learn to go that direction. So you're begging your reader to say, slow down and look mm. at where you come from so you can know what you're tempted by. And you're so yeah. fast. We're ignoring all these things, but when you can know what is my go-to to reach for and what am I really longing for, that takes time. It takes community. Yeah. It takes honesty, like Doubting Thomas. 
takes uh, courage to let um, God into those places. So I just love this invitation. And uh, it might be my new book that I give out to everyone to read, Albert. Um, come <laughs> on. Say that in front yes, of you. I, come yeah, on. <laughs> because even the other part you're calling the church on, um, I mean, not every, there's denominations across the board and our theology shifts here a little bit, but even the subtle, like God's only in the blessing, only when he shows up and you go, whoa, that's not biblical at all. So that it's alone not, is so yeah. good. That's so good. Yeah. And the other thing is that I, that I was just thinking about, I, I just thought about this, man, to your point, Tara, about slowing down, very few good things happen fast. Like if you really think about it, a lot of greatness never happens fast. Um, a lot of times our, break, our, our greatest moments with God have happened when we've slowed down long enough to really sit in them and experience them and embrace them. So if you're a leader who's listening and everything's happening fast, I would try to find some Sabbath rest and try to find some pockets to know the blessing of slow. Like if you don't know the blessing of slow, I'm I'm worried about you because most bad things that happen, (laughs) happen fast. (laughs) And and, And I pastor a church, we have fast growth, we have fast increase. So I know that I know the benefit in the surge of adrenaline that comes with fast. But oh, I'm learning on this side of the pandemic and slowing down. Unhealthy staff happens fast. Fast. Unhealthy leadership habits happens really, really fast. If you're moving slow, you got a much better chance of seeing some of those dynamics and stuff in your leadership. That'll be the title of the next book, The Crock Pot Leader. <laughs> the <crock> pot leader. <laughs> That's good. Yeah we, yeah, we got that one. Nobody listening. Nobody. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so that was my next question, and you're already teasing that out. You speak about rest and, and really that being an invitation of, uh, we can rest in God even in these doubting seasons when he's going off script. Um, what are some of those practical tools? You mentioned Sabbath, which I can barely get leaders to do. I, we start with like an hour a week, <laughs> which inch our way there. Um, but talk about a few other practical tools you've used in your leadership before we wrap up. Yeah, I think Sabbath is a really big deal. I've been really trying to lock in on that and trying to make that taking a week to just taking a day to stop and let it look different. Uh, it just makes a huge difference. And the, and the other thing is God loves us so much that he'll do a Psalm 23 on us to where he'll make us lie down. <laughs> and I don't I don't want to come to that point. I want to surrender to lie down. I don't want him to make me lie down. So part of it is, Lord, I want to try to be obedient and walk in obedience um, so that you don't have to make me lie down uh, because he will do that. I've seen leaders all of a sudden just physically just can't can't go anymore because God says, I love you too much to keep you going like this. So I'm just going to make you lie down. So here, here's a here's a crisis or 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 a level of pain that it forces you into a posture of surrender. So I'm like, God, I'm good. You ain't got to force me into that posture. I'm just going to get in there. I'm just going to get in there. So and he says, you're full um, of wisdom. Good job, young. Good job, yeah, young man. Yeah. <laughs> um, th- another good rhythm and practice is my wife and I have just been doing intense therapy uh, for the last couple of years. And it's been so, so good um, just to understand ourselves, understand our dynamics, our changing dynamics. We've been married for 20 years. Who she was 20 years ago ain't who she is today. Uh, And who I was 20 years ago, I ain't that dude today either. And to have someone walk us through understanding of that. So opportunities to have other people speak into your marriage and speak into your leadership is just huge. Uh, I think that's I think that's really profound. And we um, we date each other on a regular basis. Every Tuesday night is date night in our house. So our kids know it. We have someone that comes over every Tuesday night. So some rhythms to keep us connected. If you are a married leader, um, your marriage is the most important thing in your life. Um, I, I, um, I've never even said this publicly, but I think it'll be a part of our testimony. La Rosa, in a season of our marriage, came to me and said, 
yeah, you're a better pastor than you are a husband. Mm. And I had to, um, I had to sit with that and say, that is not the goal. And I've got to, I've got to regroup and I've got to get this thing right. So that's a part of my testimony of God re-breaking the bone so that you grow well and that you grow right. Um, so don't allow the success of ministry to come at the expense of your greatest ministry. And that's your family. That's your community. That's the people that are around you um, and your ability to show up well for them. So I feel like your practices and your rhythms need to be so personal and so local. And then that will impact whatever global impact you have. But your practices and your rhythms are for your soul. It's for the people that you love, your, your spouse or your children or your community that you're around if you're single. Man, those practices are the biggies. And then the, the, the stuff that gets applause, that gets emails and gets response, that's that's that that's the that's the over that's the over the overflow of that. But don't don't miss the most important ministry that you have, and that's your own soul, and then the souls that God has entrusted around you as your family and your 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 immediate community. I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned in the last few years, um, and it's come through a lot of pain and through a lot of um, through a lot of self awareness. Yeah. Albert, thank you for your vulnerability and healthy vulnerability to share that part of your testimony and what you were say, saying and integrating. And I think a lot of our listeners, if not all of them, can relate and connect and, and respect and appreciate that. It's uh, we, we are becoming, we, we are sons and daughters and we are becoming um, more yeah. and more, hopefully, who God envisioned us to be before we were even formed. We were just reading about the yeah. formed and uh, around our table. Thank you for uh, for sharing from the heart, for connecting dots between what we long for and what we're reaching for. It's a significant mm -hmm. distinction. It's going to help. It's a leadership uh, task right there. No matter if you're at home, at work, in your community, that there's wis great wisdom in discerning that. And you can help us do that through your book, Disobedient God. And uh, as we as we wrap up here, tell our listeners where they can find you. Uh, how can they connect to you and to the resources here that you're describing? Well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your platform with me. It's such a blessing to be here. And my name is uh, Albert Tate. So on Instagram, on Twitter or X or whatever they're calling it this week um, and, and all that, uh, you can find me. Just search my name and all those things are there. But Disobedient God is out at bookstores uh, or wherever you find books on Amazon. Uh, go pick it up. And, um, and I believe it'll be a blessing to you. I believe it'll take you on a journey that'll enrich your relationship with God, um, especially in those moments when he goes off script. So thank you guys so much for having me. Love the work that you do and just honored to be here, y'all. Thanks, Albert. Mm, thank, thank you, you. Albert. Now, Albert, I want to have you back to talk about um, reconciliation and maybe bring that conversation back to the forefront in many ways. So Absolutely. we'll have Albert Tate back on the podcast. Look for that maybe in 2024. And trying to get our schedules aligned is always the tricky piece. I'm all ready. Um, come on, y'all. Have me back. Yeah. Come on. Show uh, me some back. love. Well, Bring me back. Yeah. I'd love to come back. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have you back. So, and if you're okay. listening and something struck you, go get this book and then definitely check out our website at livingwholehearted.com where we have professional counselors to really help you. We were helping you leaders understanding um, the load that you're carrying and the way that it impacts you, your soul, your marriage, your kids. We're here for you and your family. We also have our executive coaching um, where we're doing the work and helping you move forward, envisioning what God has called you to, pruning off all the things that he hasn't called you to, and learning to align your life here and now in that same direction, which often is slower. So come right. join us in our executive coaching, our cohorts. Learn more at livingwholehearted.com. And until next week, continue growing and being the leader you would follow. This podcast is powered by Living Wholehearted, Courageous Girls, and the Christian Parenting Podcast Network. Thank you for joining us in this critical movement of shrinking our integrity gaps between what we preach and live. Mm -hmm.